Hello, friends, and welcome to Jewels of Truth. My name is Daniel Fontenot, and today I want to address an issue here that we will see in the near future, actually. If you remember, if you've studied, you know, the history of the church, the history of the pagan Roman Empire, in those days of the pagan Roman Empire, athe uh, uh, Christians were considered atheists. Can you believe it? That, that, that's, that's, that's always been so ironic to me, so strange. How could a people who are pagan call Christians atheists? Because an atheist is a person who doesn't believe in God. You know, how could you do that? Well, the only thing I've ever been able to come up with is because that the pagans believed that their gods were the true gods and anything else was not a god. So if you didn't believe in their gods, you were considered an, an atheist. So in the near future, Seventh-day Adventists will be considered atheists. On History will repeat itself. So the question is, are Seventh-day Adventists atheists? Really? This is an article by E.J. Wagner uh, in, November, in, the, in the American Sentinel of November 1888. And uh, E.J. Wagner is addressing... Uh, Jonathan Edwards' speech, he's addressing his speech in this periodical, The American Sentinel. So this speech was, it was delivered at the National Convention of the National Reform Association held in New York City, February 26, 27, 1873. It is part of the publishing proceedings of that convention, and together with the other speeches, is circulated to this very day as representative national reform literature. Notice, this speech is circulated even to the time of, because uh, you know it was made in 1873, this speech by Jonathan Edwards, made in 1873, February. But uh, this article by Jones, by uh, E.J. Wagner was in November of 1888. So you're talking about how many years later? 1873, about 15 years later, okay, uh, E.J. Wagner is writing this article, and he's saying that to his day, and prob probably beyond, that Jonathan Edwards' speech uh, has been circulated, and it, it, it was representative of the national reform literature, although extracts have previously been made from it in the Sentinel, we publish a large portion of it at the present time in order that, that, I, that our readers might feel fully assured that there is necessity for, such, for just such a work as the Sentinel is doing, and that in opposing what is miscalled national reform, we are opposing nothing but a scheme of wicked selfishness. A, the few comments that we make will be made, will be found in brackets. So if you if you're if you have downloaded the notes from this video, be aware that the parts in this in these notes that are indented. This is uh, uh, E.J. Wagner's comments on Jonathan Edwards' speech. Okay, the part that is wider, that's Jonathan Edwards' speech. The text that is wider, you know. That's Jonathan Edwards' speech, but the one that's more narrow, it's indented. That's uh, E.J. Wagner's comments. So John Jonathan Edwards said this, We want state and religion, and we are going to have it. It shall be that so far as the affairs of state require religion, it shall be revealed religion, the religion of Jesus Christ, the religion, oh, uh, I'm sorry, the Christian oath, and Christian morality shall have in this land an undeniable legal basis. We use the word religion in its proper sense as meaning a man's personal relation of faith and obedience to God. Now here is E.J. E. Wagner's comments on that paragraph. What is Christian morality? 
It is simple, simply Christianity. As Mr. Edwards says, it is a man's personal relation of faith and obedience to God. And this takes in not simply outward acts, but the thoughts and intents of the heart. That is what Mr. Edwards and the National Reform Association want to see placed on an, quote-unquote, undeniable legal basis. That is, the Christian religion and Christian morality shall be enforced by law. A man's personal relation to God in matters of faith and obedience is to be interfered with by the law of the land. <clears throat> in reality, the National Reform Association proposes that no man shall have any direct personal relation with God, but that he shall approach God only through the medium of the state, controlled by the church. This sounds like, almost like the, uh, the video I did just previously to this one here, where, where, I, where I was addressing uh, the Immaculate Conception and, you know, the idea that the Catholic Church puts forth that Mary and the saints are to be mediators between God and man, that we can't, we can't have a personal relationship with, with, with Jesus Christ because he's so far above us. He's not part of us. He didn't take our human nature upon himself. Okay, this, this is Catholic. Okay, they may not profess to be Catholic, but they're expressing Catholic sentiments. In other words, the state church is to be to the individual in the place of God. This is Catholicism. And what will that be but another papacy or an exact copy of the present one? Nothing else in the world. But, Brother, ja Brother Wagner asked, but, but it will be asked, how will it be possible for the state to deal with Christian morality since it has to do with the thoughts of the heart and the faith which one holds? How can the laws take cognizance of a man's thoughts and personal belief in the very same way that the papacy did, in whose steps the National Reform Association is following? And after which it is molded or modeled. By means of the Inquisition, the church forced the mass of the people to believe just what it wanted them to believe. This reminds me of a recent video that I did, a presentation that I did, and a person who commented upon that video because I was, I was criticizing the Catholic church's beliefs, um, they said, this person said, bring back the Inquisition. So if you think that that spirit of the Inquisition is dead, think again. Whenever a man was suspected of heresy, he was dragged, this is talking back in the time of, of the Dark Ages, whenever a man was suspected of heresy, he, he was dragged into the secret chamber and was stretched upon the rack. In most cases, that succeeded, in most cases, that succeeded in making him an obedient child of the church. Yes, the church will have ample power to deal with heretics when it has its dogmas fixed on an undeniable legal basis. The rack, the thumbscrew, and the stake are wonderful promoters of orthodoxy. To say that the National Reform Theocracy, when formed, would not follow the papacy in this respect is just as much as in the formation of a man-made man theocracy. Let me start over again. To say that the National Reform Theocracy, when formed, would not follow the papacy in this respect just as much as in the formation of a man-made theocracy is to say that men are now made of different material from what they were 300 years ago. Religious, religious persecution will be the necessary result of the success of the National Reform Association. <clears throat>
And let me be even more blunt here than was E.J. Wagner. To say, I'll say it this way. To say that the national reform theocracy, when formed, would not follow the papacy in this respect, just as much as in the formation of a man-made theocracy, is to say that if you place a chunk of red meat before a lion, he's not going to devour it. Jonathan Edwards continues, Now we are warned that, in, that to engraft this doctrine upon the Constitution will be found oppressive, that it will infringe the rights of conscience, and we are told that there are atheists, deists, Jews, and Seventh-day Baptists who would be sufferers under it. He could just as well have included Seventh-day Adventists. I accept it as a compliment that we are called upon to consider objections of this sort, if there be any ground for them. So he's saying, oh, I consider that as a compliment that you, that, that you should ask, that you should, that you should uh, um, <clears throat> protest that to engraft this doctrine upon the Constitution will be found oppressive, that it will infringe uh, upon the rights of conscience. He considers it a compliment to answer that question. We are the conscience party. Wow. You know, things are going on in this world today where you have some people in the government and outside the government that want to be conscience for us. They want to be the thought police. Well, this went back way back then in the 1870s. He says, we are the conscience party, the free conscience party. Really? We are the very people to be held responsible if we trespass upon the consciences of others. And it will be found that we do not intend to do this and that we do not do it, in fact, we don't, we don't really uh, oppress the conscience, trespass upon the conscience of others. He says, the atheist is a man who denies the being of a God and a future life. To him, mind and matter are the same, and time is to be all and in the end, all of conscience and of character. Let me read that again. To him, mind and matter are the same, and time is the be-all and the end-all of all consciousness and of character. The deist admits God, but denies that he has any such personal control over human affairs as we call providence or that he ever manifest himself and his will in a revelation. The Jew admits God, providence, and revelation, but rejects the entire scheme of the gospel redemption by Jesus Christ as sheer imagination, or worse, sheer imposture. The Seventh-day Baptist believes in God and Christianity and are conjoined with the other members of this class by the accident of differing with the mass of Christians upon the question of what precise day of the week shall be observed as holy. So he's saying here that Seventh-day Seventh -day Baptists, and by default, I guess you would say, Seventh-day Adventists, they're, he's, putting, he's putting them all together with Jews and deists and atheists. Why does he put them with them? Because he believes that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord our God and not the first day of the week. Notice that the Catholics are not included in this. Interesting. When Catholics believe in idolatry, I'm just going to say it that way. They believe that it's okay to be an, an idolater. Couldn't they be put on this list? These are all for the occasion, and so far as our amendment is concerned, 
one class. Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh-day Baptists, Jews, Deists, and Atheists. Okay, they're all one class as far as he's concerned. They use the same arguments and the same tactics against us. They must be counted together, which we very much regret, but which we cannot help. The first named is the leader in the discontent and in the outcry. Okay, that's the atheist. The atheist, to whom nothing is higher or more sacred than man, and nothing survives the tomb. In his class, I mean, it is his class. Its labors are also wholly in his interest. Its success must be holy, must be almost wholly his triumph. The rest, okay, the rest, which meaning, you know, the deists, the Jews, the Seventh-day Ab- Seventh Baptists, Seventh-day Adventists, are, they are adjuncts to him in his contest. They're, they're connected with him. They must be named from him. They must be treated as, for this question, one party. Now, look at it. Look at this controversy. The question is not between opinions that differ, but opinions that are opposite, that are contradictory, that mutually exclude each other. It is between Christianity and infidelity. It is between theism and atheism between the acknowledgement of a God and the denial that there is any God. We cannot too seriously ponder this, since the rights of conscience are held to be involved. The, the atheist does not believe in the soul. He denies that there is any such thing as conscience, yet he comes to those who confess both to insist upon his rights of conscience. I have a few plain, earnest words about all this. He says, I do not believe that there, I mean, I do not believe that every man is an atheist who says he is one. I distinguish between minds that doubt or deny the existence of God and those who doubt or deny the sufficiency of the logic usually employed to prove it. And I love to think genuine atheism impossible to the human soul. But now, bring forward your atheist, your man who confesses to neither God, angel, nor spirit, your man who believes in all unbelief and in nothing else. And I know at once what his position is. His religion is irreligion. Now, now mind you, let's, let's keep in mind, keep in mind, that he's not only speaking to atheists here, to it, I, I, on his own admission, he is grouping Seventh-day Ab- Seventh Baptists and by default Seventh-day Adventists, Deists and Jews. Yeah, okay. His religion is irreligion. His morals are only natural morals, the morals of the body, the animal in man, which in his view is all there is of man. His speculations do not rove or float among the dreams of philosophy, but they run into the concrete forms of politics, into the platform of parties and the enactments of legislatures. Atheism is always political. What are the rights of the atheist? I would tolerate him as I would tolerate a poor lunatic, for in my view, his mind is scarcely sound. In other words, the atheist you know, really hes like messed up in his mind. So long as he does not rave, so long as he is not dangerous, I would, I would tolerate him. I would tolerate him as I would a conspirator. The atheist is a dangerous man. He not only rejects and opposes my faith, but he aims to overturn, overturn every institution and to dissolve every relationship growing out of my faith. He would destroy the very foundations, pull down everything, and build up nothing. But he shall be tolerated. He may live and go free, hold his lands and enjoy his home. He may even vote. But for any higher, more advanced citizenship, he is, as I hold, 
utterly disqualified. And we are aiming not to increase, but to render definite his disqualification, to give to our government and all our free institutions a guarantee that he shall never have control over them. And what he's saying here, what this Jonathan Edwards is saying in the end of this paragraph, is completely opposed to our Constitution, which says, which says that there shall be no religious test given to one who wants to hold a public office. Because they didn't want to force people to become Christians. In the beginning of this country, the United States of America, they wrote our Constitution so that no one would be forced to become a Christian in order to you know, serve in public office. And they surely didn't want some, which some did it anyway, they didn't want uh, people to say, well, hmm, the people won't vote for me unless I make some profession of Christianity. Okay, they didn't want that either. But this man, Jonathan Edwards, says, we need to write in our Constitution, if you're not a Christian, sorry, you're excluded, you can't run for public office. So, Brother E.J. Uh, e. Wagner now continues, and he comments on uh, Jonathan Edwards' uh, speech. In the above declarations, we have religious persecution defended as plainly as words can do so. Notice, the man who believes in God, the Bible, and the gospel of Jesus Christ, but who differs with the mass of professed Christians solely upon the question of what precise day of the week shall be observed as the Sabbath, is declared to be an atheist. So in their minds, because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm considered an atheist by some of these people. That spirit has not died. Do not deceive yourselves. The man who observes the seventh day as the week instead of the first is declared by his representative, by this representative of the National Reform Association to be an atheist. Although he implicitly believes in God and the Bible and trusts in Jesus Christ as his Savior, he conscientiously observes the seventh day as a religious duty and does it as an act of worship to the God who created the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is. Yet, he is to be treated as an atheist. And what sort of treatment is the atheist to receive? He is to be treated as a conspirator and a lunatic. Think about that. That is, he is to be kept underground and shut up. If he has the courage to, uh, of, of, of his convictions, if he has the courage of his convictions and attempts to teach others what he believes to be a matter of solemn obligation to God, he is raving and must be shut up as a dangerous man. One who would suppose, I'm sorry, one would suppose that Ignatius Loyola must be the patron saint of the National Reform Association. Whatever plea its leaders make, they invariably run into religious persecution. That is the logic of national religion. Now, I hesitate to say this, since he brings up Ignatius Loyola and says that the patron saint of the National Reform Association, you would think the patron saint would be Ignatius Loyola. Recently, I discovered that a man who was uh, one of uh, President Trump's uh, advisors back when Trump was president uh, ha has, been, has been following the teachings and the spiritual formations of Ignatius Loyola, himself being a Catholic. That is the logic of national religion. 
and brother, not brother, but uh, Jonathan Edwards continues, yes, to this extent I will tolerate the atheist, but no more. Why should I? The atheist does not tolerate me. He does not smile either in pity or in scorn upon my faith. He hates my faith, and he hates me for my faith. He is bent on exterminating me and my faith altogether. Crush the wretch, said Voltaire, of my Savior and his cause. And this is still the atheist motto and his aim. I have received letters and tracts which show this very clearly. Were I to read to you the shocking blasphemies, the words of hate and of murder which they contain, you would shudder in horror. He means to make all these words good among us as soon as he can. And I am asked to accord rights of conscience to a man who says to me, come, let me show you how I can use the knife with which I propose one day to cut your throat. Come, let me explain to you the force of some nitroglycerin which I have prepared to blow you up. Let me stop again and remind us that the person making this speech, Jonathan Edwards, is including Seventh-day Baptists and, and by default Seventh-day Adventists and Jews and Deists. Okay, he's saying that we want to cut his throat. I can be as calm and as willing in the one case as in the other. And I am asked to tolerate the atheist creed under peril of violating the rights of conscience. And this tolerating of atheism means, I suppose, that our constitution and law shall be so framed as to imply that there is as much of truth, probability, and good in atheism as in Christianity. Tolerate atheism in this sense, sir? Never, never. We know what atheism is and what atheism does. We know what it builds and how it operates with its natural morals, its death and eternal sleep, its liberty, equality, and fraternity. Twice at least in the world's history has it shown what it is capable of doing. Twice across the plains of gay and sunny France has, its driv has it driven its car of, of progress, and the whole track has been rapine, or rapine and blasphemy and blood. Okay, now, uh, Brother E.J. Wagner comments on this, and he says, if this is a true specimen of national reform Christianity, may we be delivered from it. That is a fair representation. That it, I'm sorry, that it is a fair representation cannot be denied. Few, however, are so incautious as Mr. In, uh, Edwards in revealing the true inwardness of the scheme. The argument is, the atheist does not tolerate me, therefore I will not tolerate him. He does not love me, therefore I will not love him. Christ says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, Matthew 5, 44 and 45. But the national reform idea of Christianity is just the opposite of this. It is to hate those that hate you and to set them an example in hating and to give them cause for hatred by hating them first. Therefore, it is as plain as anything can be that the national reform religion is anti-Christian. How could it be anything else? It is molded after the papacy and the papacy is antichrist. While there are many good people who are indifferent now or are even in the ranks of the national reformers because of imperfect knowledge, the time will come when no man can be a Christian, that is, a real follower of Christ, unless he actively opposes the work of what is called national reform. 
national reformers accuse us of joining hands with infidels in opposing their work. We oppose it because we are Christians and because we want the pure religion of Christ to have free course. And let me remind us, and there may be some who don't realize this, who are watching this video. The national reformers of that day, they were the ancestors of the conservatives of today. Okay? And the, the make, uh, make America Great Again, there's all, there's, there's several different uh, titles for these people, but these people have the same sentiments as these national reformers. Make no mistake about it. Jonathan Edwards now continues. I can tolerate difference and discussion. I can tolerate heresy and false religion. I can debate the use of the Bible in all our co common schools, the taxation of church property, the propriety of, of chaplaincies, chaplaincies, and the like. But there are some questions past debate. Tolerate atheism, sir? There is nothing out of hell that I would not tolerate as soon. The atheist may live, as I said, but God helping us, the taint of his destructive creed shall not defile any of the civil institutions of all this fair land. Let us repeat, atheism and Christianity are contradictory terms. They are incompatible systems. They cannot dwell together on the same continent. And let me repeat again. This man is grouping Seventh-day Baptists and by default Seventh-day Adventists and Jews and Deists together with atheists. And he is saying that we cannot dwell together with them, on the, with them, these national reformers, on the same continent. And let us note that this atheism among us is busy. It is aggressive with societies, with organs, with agents, with their prayers and their preachers. But recently they have impart but recently they have imported a man, the papers say, at a salary of fifteen thousand dollars to go through the land <clears throat> lecturing and organizing, telling us how to Germanize and un Americanize our country. Their organizations raise money, issue publications, form public sentiment, and secure votes against our Sunday laws, our blasphemy laws, our temperance laws, our cruelty laws, our laws of social purity and home sanctity, our oath-sealed guarantee for truth and, and fidelity, and to bring us all down to mere natural morals. We too must organize and make effort. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Now, notice in this, uh, near the end of this paragraph here, he says that these atheists, they, um, among other things, they secure votes against our Sunday laws. Well, Seventh-day Adventists did so too. So, you know, we're against blaspheming God, but we don't want a law prohibiting blasphemy. And I could go on with this. <clears throat> Another anticipated difficulty which is urged against us is to determine what Bible to recognize. Now, this is interesting. This difficulty is but imaginary, Jonathan Edwards says. There is but one Bible. What is called the Catholic or the Protestant Bible is but the Catholic or the Protestant version of the one original Bible. And with every strong conviction that the Protestant version is the better one, I am free to say that any Bible is better than no Bible. So as far as Jonathan Edwards is concerned, it doesn't matter whether you read a Protestant Bible or a Catholic Bible. And there are a lot of people in this country that feel that way. Even among the Protestants, they don't care. They don't care that there are two lines of Bible, a corrupt one and a pure one. They don't care. 
And yet another objection is that the law of Moses will have to be reenacted and enforced among us, and that these laws are not at all fitted to our times, our freedom, our civilization. Okay, so he knows that there are some who object to, to the national reformers and say, if you, do, if you pass all these laws, you're going to have to bring in the laws of Moses, and that these laws are not fitted to our times, our freedom, our civilization. And he says, I confess that I am not at all afraid of Moses. I find among his institutions the germs of our own glorious republic. Really? And the provisions and the spirit of our best laws. But the objectors do not seem to have read the Bible enough to see what a self-interpreting book it is. It records a prophecy and afterwards records its fulfillment. It records a promise and afterwards states when and how the bestowment was, was affected. It records a ritual and afterwards records what abrogated it and took its place. It gives of itself the clue to distinguish what is of enduring value and moral obligation from what is logical, typical, transitory. Now, if there be anything in the laws of Moses, which the coming of Christ and the subsequent overthrow of Judaism did not abrogate, let them be pointed out. There cannot be many of them, and we are prepared to accept them and have them reenacted, thus much, uh, thus much as to uh, the uh, objections and objectors. Now, in other words, these, the, the way this thing is worded, it's kind of difficult to follow, but in other words, he's basically saying, you know, I'm okay with bringing back uh, stoning for adultery or, you know, overeating, all kinds of things like that, okay? He, he's okay with that, and even for Sabbath breaking, okay? For, yes, for Sabbath breaking. This guy would be for Sabbath breaking, and if you think that that was way back then in the 1870s, you're mistaken. Look up, look up and research the Reconstructionists here in this country. And they've been, you know, they're not so prominent as, they, as what they were, you know, 30, 40 years ago. But people like these Reconstructionists are still alive. Um, their sentiments, their philosophies, their positions are still alive and are influencing our, uh, our politicians. So... Coming close to the end of this article here, Brother E.J. Wagner comments, and he says, Nothing more is needed than to ask the reader to stop a minute and consider the unparalleled presumption of this statement. Could anything more clearly show the spirit of the papacy? The Apostle Paul described the Pope as that man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4. And what position does the National Reform Association occupy? It proposes to occupy the very same position, yes, as the man of sin. If there is anything in the Old Testament that has not passed away, that was not transitory and local, and that has not expired by statute of limitation, they propose to enact it when they set up their theocracy. That is to say that none of the laws of God will be, will be valid until they have set to them the seal of their approval. What more could they say to show that by their proposed scheme of government, they oppose and exalt themselves above all that is called God. Back to Jonathan Edwards, and he says, I will not, uh, it will not do to say, we had better leave things as they now are. In other, in other words, he's saying, it's not, gonna, it's not going to do to say, just leave things the way they are, okay, as, as they now are. Things are in a state of change, of transition. They will, not, they will not stay as they now are. It will not do to say, 
Let us trust the voice of a Christian people for the perpetuity of Christian principles and usages among us. In, in other words, he's saying, it's not going to do to let the people vote about these things. Let the Christian principles and uh, decide this. For in despite of their voice and their influence, the molding, overriding force of our national constitution has more and more eliminated the notion of God and of moral character from our recent state constitutions and from the decisions of our courts. And this reminds me of how people, they moan and groan about what happened in the early 1960s when prayer was, was outlawed in the public schools. As if the parents couldn't teach their children in their own homes to pray. As if the pastors and the churches couldn't teach their children to pray. You have to have prayer in the public schools and then you end up promoting your religion. Which religion, Catholic or Protestant? If we do not carry this measure, we take the side of atheism. You are called upon, fellow citizens, to make your election between Christianity and atheism. Under which king? Bezonian? You cannot be too soon in making your response. I cannot doubt what your decision will be. And that's the end of Jonathan Edwards' speech. And in closing, E.J. Wagner now comments, We would that we could be assured that the great majority of the people would decide against such a scheme of iniquity as this. But we have no such hope. Our greatest hope and desire is to arouse those who still have the spirit of true Protestantism in their hearts. It matters not how many fine speeches national reformers may make, nor what good professions they may make, it is by such utterances as those that we have been considering that the thing must be judged. To all who read this, we say, you are called, he, now, he's, now he's kind of repeating the words of Jonathan Edwards up to a point. To, to all who read this, we say, you are called upon to make your decision between the religion of Christ and that of Antichrist. Which will you choose? You cannot be too soon in making your response. And I echo that sentiment, that question. Dear listener, you who are viewing this video on YouTube, you are called upon to make your decision between the religion of Christ and the religion of Antichrist. Which will you choose? You cannot be too soon in making your response. If you appreciate this type of content, then I would encourage you to tap that like button at the bottom of this video so that it can be sent far and wide to those who are hungering for the bread of life. If you have any questions or comments, then place them at the bottom of this video I certainly will read them all. And if you haven't subscribed, we would highly encourage you to do so. We thank you for joining us here at Jewels of Truth, and we hope that you will have a good day in the Lord.